For this fall season, I tried watching as many shows as humanly possible. I think I failed, but nonetheless, here are my thoughts on the shows that aired that I was able to watch. Now keep in mind, this is brief because it's a lot. So let's get started. <music> Bleach, Thousand Year Blood Arc. After a decade since the Lost Agent arc aired, Bleach is finally back in a tour de force. Animated once more by Studio Pierrot with an ensemble production team, this new set of Bleach episodes have wonderful animation, kinetic action, and visual direction that really emphasizes the story that Kubo created, and a final war story between the Soul Reapers and the evil forces known as the Wandenreich. It has been a lot of fun to revisit the world of Bleach after so long, and also to marvel at the fact that life has changed so much in 10 years. This huge gap in time certainly helped the adaptation, creating a desperation as we see our heroes in their bleakest moment. Certainly, this arc of Bleach is one of the best anime out of 2022. Shinobi no Itoki, an original anime produced by DMM Pictures and animated by Troika. Shinobi no Itoki tells the story of Itoki Sakuraba, an ordinary student whose life is turned upside down when he finds out he is the heir to the Iga ninja clan. These ninjas are currently in a battle to defend their territory against their rivals, the Koga clan. Our main character is forced into this new life to protect himself and the village. I will be completely transparent with you guys. The only reason I checked out the series was because of the poster which features a dusk-colored backdrop with modern ninja in the foreground. While decently animated, I wasn't loving the series as I thought I would. It's like a Naruto story, but in modern times, but dull and badly paced with a lot of bland characters. I like the initial hook, but it being an anime original, it suffers like many of its kin. It throws multiple plot lines at you in a span of 12 episodes. I mean, heck, several manga to anime adaptations suffer from this as well. A good effort by updating the ninja element, but it ultimately fell flat for me. Chainsaw Man. You have Bleach Mondays. Tuesdays were all about Chainsaw Man. Or is it Chainsaw Tuesdays? Regardless, Chainsaw Man finally arrived. Announced back in December of 2020, this has been people's most anticipated anime adaptation for the past two years, and boy did Studio MAPPA deliver. You can feel the energy and care that went into this. Honoring Fujimoto's chaotic modern masterpiece, MAPPA went out of their way to craft an experience. The action's intense, visceral, and quite shocking to the uninitiated. The story reminds me of all the badass extremeness of the 90s when it comes to comics and manga. This adaptation features some of the best CG work in anime, an A-list voice cast, and really good art direction. Love Flops Another original anime, this time by the folks at Passion, Love Flops is a harem romantic comedy with a pretty surprising twist. The story begins with the character of Asahi Kashiwagi, an average high schooler in a not-too-distant futuristic Earth. On one particular day, Asahi's life is flipped upside down as he encounters five beautiful girls as he dodges their odd love confessions. Look, a lot of people clowned on this. You saw the videos. I'm not here to make excuses on this show. This isn't the best rom-com you'll see. Or is it? Let's get some things out of the way. The fan service on this show isn't the best, and it turned off a lot of viewers. Love Flops goes for the classic etchy humor and rather risque animation. This is, of course, being drawn by Passion Studios, so it isn't too surprising. They've made a name for themselves with good character designs and infamous titles, just say that much. The series starts out as you would expect. However, I, like many, kept noticing subtle changes and oddities each episode. Maybe I was just numbed by all the shows I was watching this season, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it at first. The series throws several twists on the genre that really make you question just what the heck you're watching. Some bad, some actually quite hilarious. However, it isn't until the story's final act that you realize what is really going on, and man, I was not ready for that. Maybe the fan service and bad etchy humor was just a distraction to subvert your expectations, 
or it was all in poor taste. Regardless, Love Flops proves that one shouldn't judge a book by its cover, or at least give it a few chapters before judging it. The Human Crazy University Quite possibly one of the craziest and most underrated shows of 2022, The Human Crazy University is entirely unique and utterly bizarre. Based on a manga of the same name, Human Crazy University explores the world of Satake Hirofumi, a prisoner on death row for murdering his fiance. He's also an undead man that has survived many extreme situations. For it, he's earned the interest of the Human Crazy University, which studies weird phenomena and the people that survive extreme moments. Escaping death row, Satake is now trying to remember why he would kill his beloved Chie in this oddball of a show that really looks like it came out of a Newgrounds animated video. As bizarre as the overall concept is, even weirder is the show's obsession with the odd trivia it presents. In this show, you'll learn about famous near-death experiences, geography, the culinary world, world trivia, and so much more. In all its gonzo-like comedy, the story of why an honest man would commit such a heinous crime and escaping near-death experiences is actually quite compelling. If you're eager to try something different and way out of the norm, I highly recommend watching The Human Crazy University. The Eminence in Shadow where do I begin with this one? The Eminence in Shadow is many things in disguise. In it, we follow a young man that wants to be a mastermind who exerts power from the shadows. You know, like a vigilante. On a particular day, his training is cut short when he's struck by a truck and dies. Now reincarnated in a fantasy world with magic, he goes by Sid Kageno where he turns to meta-humor to live a mediocre life so as to not stand out as he secretly runs his organization called Shadow Garden. With it, he will combat the deadly cult of Diabolos with his squad of powerful girls. This adaptation is certainly reaching for every trope. Some would write it off as a power fantasy for the adolescent youth, but I honestly just thought this was going for a Frank Miller comic with a twist and hot anime babes, because why not? I wasn't too engaged with the series. Unfortunately, I never found the main character to be that compelling, nor his allies. If what I read online was correct, while the anime extends beyond the typical 12 episodes, it mostly just sticks to adapting one volume of the light novel, which is pretty wild if you ask me. The heroics involved give off a Code Geass vibe, only not as engaging. If you're into overpowered main characters, fan service, vigilantes, and isekai tropes, look no further than the eminence in shadow. Immoral Guild Initially, I made the silly decision to ignore what Immoral Guild was about. Having only read the original Japanese title, which is Futoku no Guild, I just assumed it was an action comedy fantasy, and that is accurate, but like I mentioned, I was not paying attention to the immoral part of the equation. The show, based on the manga of the same name, is brought to us by TNK Studio, the ones responsible for such series as Redo of Healer, School Days, and High School DxD, to name a few. I don't even have to tell you that this is definitely not for kids, or families, or anyone with a sane life. Immoral Guild follows the character of Kikuru Madan, one of the best monster hunters in town that decides to quit because of fears that he might be wasting his youth. However, he thinks the guilds will suffer with his absence. The receptionist at said guild assigns Kikuru for recruits. The beast woman Hitamuki, Maidena the prodigy, a laid-back Toxico Danar, and the stalwart Hanabata, probably butchered all those names. Though they possess skills, they are also extremely clumsy and unintentionally perverse. Almost the entirety of the series has a lot of sexual humor and nudity, which made it really difficult to recommend the show. Unless you're a degenerate. These are fictional characters, after all. But I understand and respect people that don't want to engage with shows of this nature. I don't really mind, and actually had a pretty fun time with the majority of the episodes and the ditzy humor presented as the girls tried to train under the main character, only to end up disappointing him and finding themselves in rather risque situations. 
The jokes don't always land, but I appreciated the effort. The show, however, does have nice uh, art. Yeah, let's go with that. Reincarnated as a sword. Another isekai. But hear me out. A good one at that. This takes the idea of that genre and shakes it up a bit. Our isekai character is a secondary one. The true star of the story is Fran, the badass and adorable cat girl. Oh, and the one character that is now in this fantasy world, he's been reincarnated as a powerful sword. Escaping slave traders, Fran encounters the sword and with his help is able to strike down her captors and set out on a journey to grow as a warrior and help those in need. Seriously, as corny as it may sound, this is a really fun show. Fran is wholesome. She's a character that you instantly want to root for. She's a little oblivious with how the world runs, but under her master's guidance, you can immediately see her growth. The art varies from good to great. The acting has a lot of quality to it. And if you're a fan of fantasy action series and don't mind subverting expectations with a young quirky cat girl as your badass with a giant sword, you'll be right at home with reincarnated as a the sword. Mob Psycho 100 Season 3. Another long-awaited fan-favorite show returned this year. Mob Psycho 100 is back with its third season and probably its most emotional and vulnerable. Studio Bones spared no expense to bring these adventures to life. The signature style is there and when stuff hits the fan, you'll be in for a treat, artistically speaking. This season balances out action-packed stories such as The Divine Tree and Psycho Helmet's arrival with more personal stories of growth for our main lead, such as choosing his career path at school, meeting a yokai hunter, to helping out the recently disbanded telepathy club make contact with aliens. The cast is as lively as always, and you can't help but be in awe as Bones once more flexes their muscle with finely crafted high octane choreographed fights while also not being afraid to try out new styles for these subtle character defining moments. Do it yourself. With each season there's always the cute girls doing mundane wholesome things genre and this season wasn't the exception. DIY is an original anime by Pine Jam about a group of girls revitalizing their school's DIY club. In it, we follow the free-spirited yet clumsy Serufu Yua, which her name cleverly resembles the title of the show. Serufu has always been a crafty girl and is now joining her school's DIY club after failing to join the elite girls' vocational high school with her friend Miku Purin Sudide. Crashing her bike and meeting the only remaining member of the do-it-yourself club sets our main character on her journey to join said club, which is in danger of being closed if it doesn't get more members. You've been here before with these kinds of shows. It's not so much the plot, but the characters and journey that really matter. Serufu is a lovely character and she's joined by other quirky, wholesome girls, which all share a passion for crafting. The highs and lows are to be expected in these kinds of shows, but between the great indie art style by Pine Jam and the cast, I found myself tuning in week after week for some DIY relaxation. One of my favorite anime of 2022 was Akiba Maid War, a phenomenal mashup of genres in an original show by one of my favorite animation studios, Progressive Animation Works. This one is so bonkers that I can't help but genuinely love it. Akiba Maid War takes us on an unconventional action-packed drama comedy ride all the way back to 1999 as we follow a 17-year-old girl named Nagomi Wahida as she begins her new job at a pig-themed maid cafe, trying to follow her dream of being a cheerful and hard-working maid. However, she soon discovers that this world isn't as sugar-coated as she thought it would be. This cutthroat version of Akihabara is filled with violent maid gang-like wars which have spanned for many years. The maids at the Oinky Doink Cafe are all pretty unique and provide much of the show's excellent humor and action. This show is violent as it is funny and successfully parodies a lot of Japanese film and TV genres, mixing otaku culture with things like mafia and yakuza films, and even women in prison film tropes. Unfortunately, I found that Akiba Made War flew under the radar, and I think this is one of the best shows of the year. It just so happens that it came out in the same season as other hitters like Bleach and Chainsaw Man. Urusei Yatsura David Productions' new take on Urusei Yatsura is one of the season's prettiest shows. 
a fantastic reboot of a beloved classic, zanier and wackier than ever. This reboot brings a lot of humor, charm, and wit with a fantastic dynamic between the lovable Lum and the lecherous and unlucky Ataru. Adapting select chapters from the classic manga by Rumiko Takahashi, David Production went all out featuring some of their best work to date. There's not much I can add to my overall impressions of this show. It retains the humor from the original, and it looks great with modern animation. I love the voice cast and eagerly await new episodes every week. Thankfully, this one will run for 20 episodes and has already been picked up for a second season. One thing to note is Sumire Uesaka's performance as Lum, which is a complete 180 from some of her previous roles, such as Hayase Nagatoro. While some of the humor and jokes in Urusei Yatsura may be a little outdated, its sincerity and honesty with telling a fun story is one of my favorite things about it. My Master Has No Tale, the Yokai and Rakugo Show. This was pure delight and wholesomeness. My Master Has No Tail follows the character of Mameda, a tanuki in disguise, as she is trying to cure her boredom in an era that doesn't fall for tricks from shape-shifting raccoon dogs. In this modern era, or rather the 1800s, she is trying to find excitement in her life through a different source. You see, one day she happened to come across Bunko, a master of Rakugo, an art form that uses storytelling to entertain audiences. Enamored by the strange power that Rakugo has on people, Mameda is now focused on trying to get Bunko to take her on as an apprentice, so hopefully one day she'll use Rakugo to trick humanity. The anime is handled by Liden Films, which can be hot or cold for me, but in this case, the art is extremely vivid and colorful. The character designs are a bit more cartoonish in nature, which lend themselves pretty well with the overall aesthetic of the show, something I'm very fond of. Also, did I mention Tanukis? I love yokai and Japanese folklore. Some of my favorite stories involve the two, so I was more than happy to give this show a shot and came out pleasantly surprised. Rakugo is a very difficult art form to present worldwide. The stories and humor may not translate well to people watching around the world, but as you continue watching, they make it compelling and fun enough for the audience to understand why it was such a hit with people. Also, they include an extra segment after each episode with Mameda explaining to the audience the stories that got told in the episode, so that certainly helps a lot. At the heart of it, My Master Has No Tale is a charming comedy with a dash of the supernatural, an enthusiastic main character that makes you care about her struggles. I highly recommend giving this series a shot. Welcome to Demon School Iruma-kun Season 3. Iruma's back for a third outing in this hit fantasy comedy. This time, in order for the misfit class to continue using the royal classroom, they all must achieve the fourth rank Dela. To help them, each pair of students is matched with a personal tutor to train and prepare them for the upcoming Harvest Festival, competing against fellow classmates in the jungle for food and points. At this point, if you've enjoyed the previous two seasons, you'll have more of the same with Season 3 which is not a bad thing. I'm really fond of the series and its wacky characters. However, there's never a huge sense of danger in the story arcs. And now with this new season, we get the traditional training and tournament tropes, which are so well known in the shonen manga department. Iruma is now under the training of Bachiko, and she's voiced by the legendary Junko Takeuchi. His efforts, along with everyone else and their respective teachers, lead them to new power levels as they take part in the festival. The majority of this first half of the season deal with every student's journey and growth, which is something that I've been wanting to see for a bit. Usually with a large cast, the story tends to stick around to just a handful of characters, but having arcs like this can give everyone their time in the spotlight. Uzaki-chan wants to hang out season 2. After a pretty long wait, we have more Uzaki and Sakurai content to consume. After the first season, the two have gotten a lot closer, but are too stubborn to move that relationship to the next step, which causes at least 95% of the jokes in this second season. That can be just fine or super annoying for the audience. I don't know, for some reason I wasn't feeling it this time around. I do like the characters and enjoy the first season back in 2020, but maybe it was the stale nature of the one recurring joke that got to me. 
Yes, there is progress, and the series shakes things up a bit by introducing and getting to know more of each character's family, but in the end, it just circles back to the will-they-won't-they they shtick. The animation is perfectly serviceable, the performances are well-acted and hilarious to listen, but like I mentioned, the overall presentation was just alright. But hey, at least Saori Hayami is back as Tsuki. I consider that a win, folks. Beast Tamer! Remember ages ago in this video when I talked about Immoral Guild? Whew, man, I gotta stop watching so many shows at once. Anyways, Beast Tamer is like Immoral Guild, but without the sexual innuendos and lewdness. In fact, I'm actually doing a disservice since Beast Tamer is not that bad. It isn't an isekai either, so that's a relief. It's an adventure fantasy series about Rain, a character that can tame Beast to aid him in battle and daily life. However, his former group fired him for being too weak and simple. Devastated, the kind-hearted Rain sets out to do smaller quests until he has a fateful encounter with Kanade, a strong, wholesome cat girl. The art on this series is perfectly fine. The talent is there, but the show never really tries to be an outlandish thing. Beast Tamer is just pure comfort food. Animated by EMT Squared, makers of such cozy content as Kuma 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 Bear, Drugstore in Another World, and I Am Quitting Heroing. The plot is fairly standard. Rain is upset over what happened as he really is a genuinely good guy that got put into the worst team imaginable. Now that he's outside that circle of negativity, the character can flourish with the beast girls that he's met. Don't worry, this show doesn't go the route you're probably thinking of. Instead, he's contracting dragon girls, fairies, and more as they go around town solving quests and getting to know each other more. The standard villains you would expect do show up, but it was just an overall pleasant experience to be had. Spy Family Part 2 the second half of the first season of Spy Family picks up immediately where the first half left off. However, this time around, with all the characterization out of the way, the show could really flourish with its main trio and their journeys together. This time, we get the long-awaited debut of Bond, the forger's lovable dog, Yor's attempts at cooking, and even the famous underground tennis tournament. The action in these episodes continue to excel, the combined efforts of Wit Studios and Cloverworks really provided us with one of the year's best animated shows. Every expression, movement, and scenery feels alive and well. Contrasting with the espionage and thrilling mystery of the plot is the heartwarming bond that is being developed by the Forger family. Definitely one of my favorite aspects of the show. I'm the villainess, so I'm taming the final boss. We've all gotten used to isekai by now. Love it or hate it, they'll keep pumping them out. However, I recently noticed a trend of multiple otome-based isekai. Characters that are either trapped in dating sims or have been reincarnated into worlds based on their favorite dating sims or dating simulators. You've had stuff like My Next Life as a Villainess, Trapped in a Dating Sim, and the upcoming I'm in Love with the Villainess. For this fall season, we were graced with I'm the Villainess, so I'm taming the final boss. In this show, we follow Eileen, who has regained her memories of her past life and now realizes she's in the world of her favorite game as the Villainess character who is destined to perish. Working out a solution to this problem, she chooses to capture the heart of the final boss, the Demon Lord Cloud. This was a charming little series with fun characters. I haven't read the original novels or the manga, so I didn't know what to expect. I enjoyed Eileen. She's a great lead character that took matters into her own hands, but also she's kind and empowered. She doesn't go by the game's logic, being able to dabble in politics, tactics, and other skills. This adaptation, however, rushed through much of the novel's contents from what I've read online. It adapted three story arcs at quite the rapid pace, and I felt it was pretty noticeable. Some elements are hand-waved, while others remain underdeveloped. I enjoyed the artistic direction and characters, even with the average writing. It isn't going to win any awards, but the neat cast of characters makes this one worth watching if you're interested in otome-based isekai. Raven of the Inner Palace. Set in a fictional version of ancient China, Raven of the Inner Palace follows the Raven Consort, 
a 16 year old living in Ye Ming Palace. And I'm sorry for butchering these names. Liu, as she's known, is able to use mysterious arts to communicate with the deceased, find lost things, and take on any curse. Meeting her in secret is Gao Jun, the current emperor, who was disinherited as a child after his mother was murdered and he seized power in an uprising against the corrupt empress dowager and had her executed. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This is a really wonderful show, but I was unprepared by the amount of world building, characters, and backstory that we have to deal with. It isn't difficult to follow, but when you've got other shows on your mind, it can all blend pretty easily. The setting, world, characters, and art are all great, and one of the year's best in my opinion. There are some genuinely touching stories told here, as the Raven Consort deals with the tragedy of servants that have lost their lives, as well as those that still live and grieve for their loved ones. There are political conspiracies and drama involving the main characters that pay off the more you watch. A majority of this adaptation is mostly dedicated to solving mysteries, and some people may be put off by that, but I still would like for everyone to check out Raven of the Inner Palace. I think it's worth your time. Bochi the Rock, one of my favorite anime of the year. In it we follow Hitori Goto, or Bochi, a high school girl who starts learning to play the guitar because of her dream of being in a band. But the problem here is her shyness, so extreme that she hasn't made any friends. That changes when she meets Nijika, a girl who plays the drums and is looking for a new guitarist for her band. Where Bochi the Rock succeeds is in its relatable characters. Having been a massive introvert through most of my life, I see myself in a lot of moments with Bochi. The fact that she's able to make friends and be part of a band is fantastic. Also, her bandmates both complement and sharply contrast our main character's quirky dilemma. Ikuyo, Nijika, and Ryo are wildly different, from extroverts to bubbly personalities to the cool, calm, and collected, and weird. What resonated with me, however, is the fact that Bochi is super talented at the guitar, yet each episode she's seen struggling with various social interactions and new scenarios that are presented to her. Yet, she's able to slowly overcome it, something I find super inspiring in a character and immediately makes me want to root for them. The art on this series is spectacular, in my opinion, one of Cloverwork's finest efforts. The amount of skill that it takes to animate band sequences and the dexterity involved in the instrument playing is something that I'm always marveled by. Not to mention, this series has a wild time highlighting our lead character's social anxiety and worries, changing art styles to reflect the severity of the moment to hilarious effects. The series is a character piece first and foremost. Yes, you could say it's one of those shows about cute girls doing mundane things, but thankfully there's no fan service to be had. It's just a straightforward, wholesome time with greatly written characters going about their lives, dreaming of success and stardom, sharp writing and clever jokes. Bochi the Rock is one of the best anime of 2022. Blue Lock couldn't be a season without some sort of sports anime, and this time we have one of the most anticipated adaptations, an anime all about soccer, or football. In it, we follow Isagi Yoichi, a high schooler with dreams of making it big and participating in the Japanese national team, competing for the World Cup. His playing style and failure to qualify to the Nationals has him down and questioning himself. That's when he receives an invitation for Blue Lock, a facility designed to train the greatest striker out of 300 high school aged forwards so that Japan can have an opportunity at winning the FIFA World Cup. Isagi is joined by several other characters in a complex facility to determine who will lead and win in a battle royale style survival sports drama. Holy crap, that's a lot. I don't really care for soccer, but I'm always down to watch sports anime. The highs and lows, the drama involved with teams, tournaments, and championships all lend themselves to wonderful, dramatic storytelling. I never found myself caring for the technicality presented with the soccer playing, but the actual matches are fun to watch. I was invested in the drama and was and cheered for these characters to advance. 
Fortunately, this first season isn't cut off by 12 episodes, so there's a lot of room for the story to flourish. Yeah, there are some sports cliches throughout, as well as some pretty ridiculous eye-rolling moments, but at the end of the day, you can't help but see past it and enjoy the ride. There are some CG moments with the ball movements that kind of took me out of it for a bit, but overall the show's great. Even if you don't care for it, it's compelling enough that I'd happily recommend it, or the manga. The Little Lies We All Tell. Okay, so for this one, we have a school comedy that follows four friends at an all-girls school. Seems normal at first, right? But then we learn that they are an alien space pilot, a former Kunoichi, a girl with supernatural powers, and a boy in girls' clothing. The Little Lies We All Tell is one of my favorite comedies this year. I love its bizarre humor, outlandish scenarios, and the dim-witted yet wholesome characters. Each girl brings some unique to the story as they just simply hang out around school and try to do normal adolescent things. It just so happens they all share some incredible secret from each other. Rika is actually an alien. Her ship crashed into the school, but everyone is mind controlled to not see it. Chiyo is a former ninja. She escaped her clan to be a normal girl in school. Sekina has psychic abilities and can read the minds of all the girls in school, except for Tsuyoshi. He's trading places with his sister and posing as her. That's sort of the gist of it all. The majority of the series is focused on the slice of life element with the wacky shenanigans the girls get involved with and how they try to solve these problems. Mobile Suit Gundam, The Witch from Mercury. It's always great when we have a new Gundam show. It's always, it's also greater when a new one shakes things up considerably. It is the first TV series in the franchise to feature a female protagonist. We follow Suleta Mercury, a young girl that is transferring to the Astikasia School of Technology run by the Barrett Group, which currently dominates the mobile suit industry. In this series, the solar system is currently split between Spacians and Earthians, inhabitants of space colonies and Earth. The Vanadis Institute created an advanced man-machine system called the Gund, which helps humans survive the harshness of space, but a mobile suit development council led by different development companies ordered a ban on Vanadis, while secretly deploying a team to destroy the facility. The only survivors are a test pilot and her daughter. Now in present time, going by Soleta Mercury, the young girl is in the Astikasia school with her Gundam Ariel, hoping to befriend others. That, in a weird nutshell, is Witch from Mercury. As of making this video, the story isn't finished, but I can safely geek out over how much I enjoy it. Soleta survived this horrific incident growing up and is now in the academy alongside her Gundam to prove her worth as a pilot. She's a timid girl with trouble communicating with people, but it isn't until meeting the rebellious Miodin, which I probably butchered, that makes her open up and befriend people. I love how every character feels unique and inclusive, and when stuff hits the fan and there's an action scene, it's really epic in scope. I highly recommend it. Go check it out. To Your Eternity Season 2, The Return of To Your Eternity, one of my all-time favorite manga. Season 2 is now being handled by Drive Studio, which does a commendable job of imitating the previous art direction from Brainspace. However, the adaptation has been rather underwhelming for me. I just don't see the attention to detail and love that came from the original source material. It all looks serviceable, helped by the fact that it has a fantastic narrative driving it forward. This is the best arc in the series with some of the best characters you'll meet. Fushi's journey continues after suffering from heavy losses in the first season and is now secluded in isolation. He is forced to return to rid the world of the knockers. Along the way, meeting fan favorite Prince Bon, a somewhat selfish and arrogant royal that you can't help but love, and as the series progresses, you'll start realizing the facade and his true intent, as well as his growth as a character. Also worth mentioning is the improved world building. Fushi is going to new places and experiencing firsthand the world he inhabits and the people that have now come to worship him. However, I just wish the art could be improved to match the original source. I still recommend To Your Eternity, this is the best arc in the story with some really memorable sequences and fights, characters and settings that should be seen or read by all. Hell, just get the manga while you're at it, read that instead. <laughs> Holy moly, after a marathon we arrive at the finale for this video, wow. 
who thought it was a good idea to marry teenagers as a school social experiment. More Than a Married Couple But Not Lovers is a rom-com that has a very eye-rolling premise. Characters take part in a mandatory couple practical course. In it, they must demonstrate that they have the necessary skill set to live with a partner of the opposite sex while presenting a level of harmony to the video surveillance that grades them. Yeah, okay, first of all, do you really expect teenagers to behave living together with another person and not get horny? Well, apparently not in this show. Our main couple is Jito Yakuin and Enakari Watanabe. Jito is an awkward introvert nerd with self-esteem issues that in a shocking twist is paired with the beautiful Gyaru Akari. The two are not supposed to work together. She is obsessed with another hot guy in her school while Jito would rather be with his childhood friend Shioti. Now both will work together to raise their scores so they can eventually change partners. Only that in yet another plot twist that no one saw coming, Akari and Jito actually start potentially liking each other and have quite the chemistry together. At first glance, this isn't the type of show I would recommend, but after a couple episodes, the silly dynamic actually grows into an interesting love story about opposites attract. Akari has a lot of insecurities to her and Jito, well, he's kind of dumb and charming at the same time. In most of the episodes, he doesn't really understand his feelings towards Akari. He's sort of liking her and blushing a lot, but still wants to be with Chiyoti, but then gets mad at Akari for her feelings towards her initial crush, Minami. And you might think Akari is this extrovert and confident person, but deep down you learn that she's super caring and sweet-natured towards her friends and loved ones. It's that dynamic that hooks you on the show, like a good telenovela. You want the two to hook up, but a majority of the plot and episodes are dedicated to providing risque scenarios that try to push the boundary, only to reset itself by the end. And in an actual shocking twist for this guy making this video, the color palette for this show is actually my favorite out of everything that I talked about today. I really enjoy the overall look and design and colors for the characters. The plot, while having a bunch of cliche tropes, is not terrible. I found myself enjoying the show even with the silly premise. A perfectly serviceable, fan servicey rom-com, if you will. And that's about it. I am spent. If you made it all the way to the end, give me your favorite emoji in the comment section. That way I know you are a true legendary viewer that watched this long ass seasonal review. Seriously, what was it? Like 25 different shows? Making this was a labor of love. So I truly appreciate it if you watched all the way through. Really means a lot. Thank you everybody for tuning in. God bless. Stay safe out there. I will catch all of you on our next episode.